check audio clear hi guys good evening good evening good evening uh I'm Dr. Sandeep, your surgery guy. So we'll be starting something called as the FMG series. I'll be discussing the most important, the most relevant topics that are going to be in your upcoming exam. And I want you to focus every single point that we're going to take across from here. It will be a bit rapid. I'll give you all the important components. I want you to have an active feedback as we do so. So let's jump in. So I'll be starting with the systemic part. We'll go from the GIT and then we travel all the way to your journal surgery, right? Right. Okay. The chat box is active. Yes, Mansoor. Thank you. All right. Okay. So without wasting any further time, let's kickstart the discussion. So we have the first disorder that I'm going to talk about is going to be a motility disorder. It's a comparison between the Ecclesia cardia and the diffuse esophageal spasm. What is the etiology of the Ecclesia cardia? The etiology of the Ecclesia cardia it is your failure of relaxation. It is the failure of relaxation of the lower esophageal segment. Right? <coughs> right. So we'll talk about what is the etiology behind it. The etiology is the failure of relaxation. It is the failure of relaxation of lower esophageal sphincter due to progressive loss due to progressive loss of neuronal plexus due to the progressive loss of the neuronal plexus and this is what results or causes the ecclesia cardia what is diffuse esophageal spasm the etiology is because of tertiary contractions now what are these tertiary contractions these are non progressive spastic contractions now, how would you see the clinical presentation of Ecclesia Cardia? Now, the clinical presentation of Ecclesia Cardia, these are more commonly seen in females when compared to males. The usual age of presentation is above 50 years and the presenting complaint will be of dysphagia. The presenting complaint will be of dysphagia. Now, as I always tell in my class, you need to have three important questionnaires for dysphagia. Now the question number one, is the dysphagia more for solids or more for liquids? The first thing you will see, dysphagia which is going to be present here, the patient will say the dysphagia is more for liquids when compared to solids. The minute you see this, your diagnosis is there. Second question is, dysphagia, is it going to be, is it going to be progressive or non-progressive? So dysphagia is for both solids and liquids, dysphagia more for liquids. As you can see, there is progressive loss of neuronal plexus. So here the dysphagia will also be progressive. The dysphagia will also be progressive across here. Now in terms of investigation, <coughs> you can perform the barium swallow because patient presented dysphagia. Now in barium swallow, you see this classical presentation. This is what we call it as the bird beak appearance. This is what we call it as the bird beak sign or also commonly referred to as the pencil tip sign. It is also called as the pencil tip sign. But if I say what is the investigation of choice? Now remember the investigation of choice for all motility disorders is going to be your manometry. It is going to be your manometry. Now I don't want to have an overburden inflammation here but when you do a manometry here Remember integrated relaxation pressure of more than 15 millimeters of mercury is suggestive of Ecclesia Cardia, right? What is your first line management? The first line management is going to be your calcium channel blockers. You have the nitrates that you can give the patient to relax the sphincter. If not, you can give Botox that is a botulinum toxin. But if it fails, then the surgery of choice is going to be your laparoscopic Heller's cardiomyotomy, right? So the surgery of choice is going to be your laparoscopic Heller's cardiomyotomy. 
it is your cardiomyotomy. This becomes the surgery of choice. The latest management that the endoscopic management that we have, it is called as POEM. POEM stands for per oral endoscopic myotomy that you can do. The same myotomy can be performed with the help of endoscope rather than doing with the laparoscopy. Coming back to the diffuse esophageal spasm, in the diffuse esophageal spasm, the characteristic features, <laughs> the clinical presentation here will be of sudden severe onset of thoracic pain. So the patient is going to have severe pain. So this is what we call it as the esophageal angina. So the presence of pain, it will be associated with dysphagia. Here, initially the dysphagia, the patient complaints will be for both solids and liquids and dysphagia remains equal for both solids and liquids. This will be a non-progressive dysphagia. This will be a non-progressive dysphagia. When you do a barium swallow, in terms of investigation, when you perform a barium swallow, you see this characteristic image that you can see. It is your classical cork screw appearance. The other appearances that you can see is going to be a rosary bed appearance, pseudo-diverticulum and the beaded appearance, right? Now, in terms of management, the first line management is going to be same. Uh, achha, the investigation of choice still remains the same. That is going to be your manometry. Now, remember in manometry, we measure now something called as distal contractile integral. If it is more than 400 millimeters of mercury, it is your diffuse esophageal spasm. But on the other hand, if the distal contractile integral is more than 8000 millimeters of mercury, then it is called as the nut cracker esophagus. Then it is called as the nut cracker esophagus. Now, when it comes down to the management, So when it comes down to the management, initially you will try the first line conservative management that is your calcium channel blockers, you have nitrates, you have Botox, you can try. But if it fails, the surgery that you will do is your long esophageal myotomy. Now this long esophageal myotomy that we speak, it starts all the way from the cricopharynx to the cardio of the stomach and that's the extensive. So this is the baseline data that you should be knowing in terms of your motility disorders of the esophagus, right? Absolutely correct. Chalo. Moving down to the next one. We'll talk about the diverticular disease. In the diverticular disease, the important components that we'll brush across. We have three different types of diverticulum in the esophagus. We have the Zenkers diverticulum, we have the mid-esophageal diverticulum and the epiphrenic diverticulum. Now remember, Zenkers is an example of a false diverticulum. Zenkers is an example of a false diverticulum. Okay. Zenkers is an example of a false diverticulum. Whereas mid esophageal is an example of a true diverticulum. Your epiphrenic is also an example of a false diverticulum. Right. Remember, Zenkers is an example of a pulsion diverticulum. That is a pushing diverticulum. Whereas your mid esophageal is an example of the tractional diverticulum. Whereas your epiphrenic is also an example of a pulsion diverticulum. It is also an example of pulsion diverticulum. Zenkers diverticulum is going to be more common on the left side. This is your left sided. Whereas the other two, these are more common on the right side. These are more common on the right side. So this is also more common on the right sided because mid esophageal and epiphrenic, you have the iota running on the left. There's no space. So the diverticulum occurs on the right side. Now, when you talk about the Zenkers diverticulum, I hope everybody knows the anatomical weakness. That is your Killian's triangle. That is going to be your Killian's descent or the Killian's triangle. Now, what are the boundaries of your Killian's triangle? Now you have an image which is present across here. This is your Killian's triangle through which it is occurring. So you see upper, you have on the upper surface, you will notice that you have the fibers which are running. These are your oblique fibers which are there and then there's a transverse fibers there. The oblique fiber that you do is your thyropharyngeus muscle. This is your thyropharyngeus 
this is your thyropharyngeus muscle which is an obliquely placed muscle and then you have the lower transverse this is your cricopharyngeus muscle this is your cricopharyngeus muscle this cricopharyngeus muscle is your lower transverse muscle it's your lower transverse muscle between these two of the Killian's triangle and you see there is an out pouching and this out pouching is your Zenker's diverticulum now the cardinal features of a Zenker's diverticulum that you will see the Zenker's diverticulum the patient will have number one regurgitation of previous day food particle there is regurgitation there is regurgitation there is regurgitation of previous day food particle of previous day food particle along with that the patient is going to have significant halitosis along with halitosis there will be intermittent dysphagia now whenever you see the word intermittent wherever you see the word intermittent you know you're talking about you know you're talking about the Zenker's diverticulum it is an intermittent dysphagia it is the intermittent dysphagia that you will see now when you say what is the investigation of choice for Zenker's diverticulum it's an anatomical defect that you have for that I would like to go ahead with barium swallow now on the barium swallow you see a classical image you see this is the posterior surface this is the anterior surface your diverticulum is on the posterior surface it's a posterior diverticulum right and that is an out pouch you can see a barium which is filled up and that is how you'll see the Zenker's diverticulum management will see the size of the diverticulum if this is less than two centimeters in size if the lip sorry if the lip is less than three centimeters in size if it is less than three centimeters that is diverticular mouth when we say this is the opening this distance we are measuring if it is less than three centimeters then diverticulostomy or we are doing to diverti i'll do a diverticulectomy sorry here and if it is more than three centimeters then we'll do an endoscopic dolmen surgery we'll do an endoscopic dolmen surgery that is for Zenker's diverticulum. These two, just remember in comparison to the other diverticulum that I've given, that is the Zenker's, di <coughs> Zenker's diverticulum in comparison to that of your epiphrenic as well as your mid esophageal diverticulum. Max to max mid esophageal diverticulum is usually secondary to TB lymphadenitis of the mediastinum. It is secondary to TB lymphadenitis that is usually seen across it, right? So this is about the diverticular disease. Now this is the GI radiology of your upper GI system. Now the first one that you can see, this is a neonate, right? What do you see here? You see a massive air bubble in the thoracic cavity. You see the lung is getting compressed. The heart has been pushed onto the other side. So there is dextrocardia, pulmonary hypoplasia with, see there is presence of dextrocardia. There is presence of dextrocardia. Specifically, I'm talking about left-sided pulmonary hypoplasia. There is left-sided pulmonary hypoplasia. There is left-sided pulmonary hypoplasia and massive air bubble in left hemithorax. There's a massive air bubble. There is a massive air bubble. in your left hemithorax in your left hemithorax so this gives you a diagnosis of what is the diagnosis very good uh, i hear you are correct <coughs> this is your congenital diaphragmatic hernia that's your bostalic hernia now we all know bostalic hernia what is where is the defect the defect in the bostalic hernia is your left sided posterolateral it's a left-sided posterolateral defect that you'll see absolutely correct 
this you can see there is an out pouch you can see this is the esophagus that is going and you see there is a out pouching that is there and that's a classical for diverticulum now this is the anterior surface this is the posterior you can see this is the cervical region so it is your cervical esophageal diverticulum now this cervical esophageal diverticulum the cervical esophageal diverticulum is your Zenker's diverticulum. This is your Zenker's diverticulum, spot on. Then you have image number three. In image number three, you can see there is a nice tapering across here. And there's a shouldering aspect here. It looks like somebody has eaten the apple and thrown away, right? Now, this is what we call it as the apple core sign, right? This is what we call it as the apple core sign. And I hope everybody knows the apple core sign is seen in esophageal cancer. Absolutely correct. The apple core sign. Talking about the apple core sign. This apple core sign is seen in esophageal cancer. It is seen in your esophageal cancer. Couple of important questions about esophageal cancer. What is the most common type overall? The answer is squamous cell variety. Where is the most common site? It is the middle one third of the esophagus, right? <coughs> what is the most important risk factor for squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus? The answer is smoking. But what is the most common risk factor for adenocarcinoma of the esophagus? The answer is going to be Barrett's esophagus. Now, when you talk about it, what is the most common route of spread? It is going to be a direct route of spread. What is the most common site of secondary? It is going to be lungs. How would you address it? We are going to perform surgery if it is an operable tumor. Now, how? what are the approaches that you have? You have three approaches. You have Ivor Lewis, McEoins, and the Oringers. What is the most common? Answer is Oringers. What is your approach? Oringers, you do leprotomy, left cervical incision. Leprotomy, left cervical incision, right? Ivor Lewis, when you talk about leprotomy and right thoracotomy. McEoins, leprotomy, right thoracotomy, left cervical incision. What is the most painful incision? The answer is thoracotomy. It has been taken out in Oringers. Now Oringers only have what? Leprotomy and left cervical incision. Remember that in the context. Right? Let's go to image number 4. What do you have image number 4? It is an upper GI endoscopic image. In an upper GI endoscopic image, what do you see? You see a pink mucosa that is there. This pink mucosa is your squamous cell. And then you see your red velvety mucosa. This red velvety mucosa is seen in, it is seen in your Barrett's esophagus. It is seen in your Barrett's esophagus. Now in Barrett's, what are the questions? Number one, what is the problem here? There is a metaplasia. What type of metaplasia? It is going to be intercellular type of metaplasia. Why? The squamous cell is getting converted into columnar cells in order to conserve themselves from the acid reflux. Now, why are you able to, uh, why is it becoming red? Because squamous cells are stratified, they are more denser. You will not be able to see the blood vessels in the basement membrane. Columnar single cell, density decreases, hence you will be able to see. And that red color from the basement membrane, that is because of the blood vessel that is visible, will give you a classical red velvety mucosa. What does Barrett's esophagus cause? It increases the risk for what? Adenocarcinoma. It increases the risk for adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. What type of metaplasia? Intestinal type. Why? Because it will have columnar cells. Along with that, there is goblet cells. Goblet cells are characteristic of intestinal mucosa. What does goblet cells produce? They produce mucin. They produce mucin. Absolutely. Right? So this is with respect to your upper GI endoscopic image. Now the fifth one. You can see there is this constriction on both the ends. And this is the level of diaphragm. So it's a mucosal web or the esophageal web that is present lower pre present. So this is called lower esophageal web. This lower esophageal web that you see, this is actually a sequelae of GRD, commonly called as the Schatzky's ring. It is called as the Schatzky's ring. Upper esophageal web is seen in plumber Vincent syndrome. What are the components of plumber Vincent syndrome? Also called as Patterson Kelly syndrome. What are the components? What are the components? The components are number one, you have iron deficiency anemia. You that is also called a sidropenic anemia. Along with iron deficiency anemia, what else do you have? Atrophic glossitis with you have visromegaly that is going to be associated with hepaton splenomegaly, then associated with koinonchia, right? These are the components. So you have iron deficiency anemia, atrophic glossitis associated. 
associated with wisdom megalian koinonkia are the features that you cannot miss out on plumber vincent syndrome obviously the upper esophageal web upper lower esophageal web is shatsky's shatsky's is a lower esophageal web it is actually a sequel a of grd the carry on message is shatsky's is lower plumber is upper esophageal web what do you see across here this is your upper esophageal web i was just talking we got the image and that's what hard work does you do it it appears there upper esophageal web this is a component of your plumber vinson syndrome now the plumber vinson syndrome is also referred to as your patterson kelly syndrome it is also referred to as the patterson kelly syndrome you can see the upper esophageal web is here now the last image that you have image number 7 on this slide what is this you see there is a nasogastric tube and it is coiling here what is the finding it is the coiling of nasogastric tube the coiling of nasogastric tube in a neonate where there is continuous regurgitation of all feeds there is continuous regurgitation of all feeds with continuous drooling of saliva there will be continuous drooling of saliva here there is continuous drooling of saliva here and then in order to prevent the aspiration you put a nasogastric tube it gets coils what is this this is your tracheoesophageal fistula right what is the most common type i know everybody knows the most common type is your type c variety what is your type c variety the type c variety is a variety where you have upper atresia lower communicating fistula what are the congenital disorders associated with tracheoesophageal fistula the answer is vactrel right v is your vertebral body defect a is your anal atresia c is your cardiovascular abnormality t is your tracheoesophageal fistula you have r for your renal abnormalities example like horseshoe kidney as well as renal angiogenesis and l for limb abnormality usually associated with radial hypoplasia these are the gi images on the upper gi that you need to concentrate is it clear clear guys right every single component with concepts keep in the same context and we'll move right chalo now again a beautiful conceptual question that is usually asked in your exam that is about your neonatal vomiting now neonatal vomiting also depends upon the age of presentation i have given you three components here let's understand this right let's say i have fourth week of presentation the vomiting of the baby is going to be non bilious <coughs> there is your non bilious vomiting and this is projectile in nature so you have a fourth week i'll just make your life more easier this is a male child here males are more commonly affected than female what is your diagnosis somebody has gotten correct yes samruddhi you're correct it is your chps fourth week male non bilious projectile image you see massive air bubble right single bubble sign this is your single bubble sign on an x ray this tells you it is your chps so this diagnosis is your congenital hypertrophic pyloroic stenosis this is your congenital hypertrophic pyloroic stenosis if i say what is the investigation of choice for chps the investigation of choice is going to be ultrasound what are the findings we know on the ultrasound you get cervix sign you get anterior nipple sign you get the circular muscle thickening sign right what is the criteria 4 mm thickness 16 mm should be the length then you'll call it a chps what is the management surgery what is the surgery of choice it is your laparoscopic ramstedt's pyloromyotomy it is your ramstedt's pyloromyotomy right so these are the components of your fourth week let's say you have a day 0 day 1 baby uh let's say this is also a male baby right here the baby presents to you with bilious vomiting this bilious vomiting is non projectile in nature again to make your life more convenient i'll give you a important pick up point here it is associated with down syndrome here it is associated down syndrome on 
X-ray, you see the classical two bubbles which are dancing next to each other. One bubble, two bubble. This is your gastric bubble, this is your duodenal bubble. What is this? This is your classical double bubble sign. Now, this double bubble sign gives you an objective. What is your diagnosis? I will not look at the screen. I know you know the diagnosis. The answer is going to be your duodenal atresia. What is the investigation of choice? The investigation of choice is going to be CT because you want to rule out another condition that can present similarly is day zero, day one, bilious vomiting recurrently happening. It is non-projectile in nature on X-ray double bubble. Can you give me another example? The another example is going to be your annular pancreas. So duodenal atresias, annular pancreas, both of them present to your similar features. Annular pancreas is a thick rim of pancreatic tissue encasing between the second and the third part of the duodenum. Right? Again, you'll have double bubble sign. CT is important to do it. Management is surgery. Surgery is duodenodudnostomy. It is your duodenodudnostomy. And this is how you'll do it across. Moving to the baby number three. What is the problem in baby number three? Day zero, day one of life. Again, let's say male baby is here. The vomiting the baby is going to present is bilious. It is going to be non-projectile. It is going to be your non-projectile vomiting to give your life more easy. It is associated with cystic fibrosis. In fact, this disorder is only associated with one congenital disorder that is cystic fibrosis. When you did an x-ray, in the x-ray I saw there are one bubble, there is another bubble and there is another bubble. So gastric, duodenal, jejunal. So this is your triple bubble sign. So where do you see this triple bubble sign? The answer where you see the triple bubble sign, I'm not going to look at the screen. I know you know the answer. The answer is jejunal atresia. Investigation of choice to confirm. It is going to be CT. What is the management? It is going to be your jejuno, jejunostomy. It is going to be your jejuno, jejunostomy. So whenever you get a case of neonatal vomiting, this table should be in your head. Sometimes if your examiner, why did we reach, okay. One second guys, okay. Sometimes in the CHPS, no, they can ask you what is the electrolyte imbalance, right? What electrolyte imbalance do you have? Repeated vomiting, it will result in metabolic alkylosis. Along with that chloride is lost. So there is loss in chlorine. So there is hypochloremia. In order to compensate, it will also lose potassium hypokalemia. It also lose protons in urine resulting in paradoxical aciduria. Paradoxical aciduria is noticed. And this is the electrolyte imbalance in CHPS. Without knowing this, you don't get to go to the exam. Clear? Right? So this is about your neonatal vomiting. Let's move to the next slide. Now, one of the most sorted exam questions repeatedly asked, what is that peptic ulcer disease? I don't want to be tied down. Let's bring it on. Right? Now, in the peptic ulcer disease, you have two components. But before we move down, usual questions to confuse you. Most common site for peptic ulcer disease. Answer? <coughs> Most common site for peptic ulcer disease. Quick feedback. Most common site for the peptic ulcer disease overall is the first part of the duodenum. Right? If I change the question, most common site of peptic ulcer disease in stomach. In stomach, the answer is going to be angularis in cisura. According to the modified Johnson's classification, this is what we call it as the type 1 gastric ulcer. So overall most common site will be your type 1 gastric ulcer. Now, quickly running through the criteria we have spoken about. Sites, duodenal ulcer is seen on the first part of the duodenum. Here, the duodenal mucosa converts into or metamorphosis into cardiac type of uh, mucosa. That is how the H. pylori will be able to proliferate here. Here, it will be more common on angularis in 
Sisura. It will be more common on Angularis in Sisura. What is the ulcer's environment? The ulcer's environment, because it is converting into gastric type of mucosa, it will be hyperacidic. Whereas gastric ulcer can either be formed in a normoacidic or hypoacidic environment, but never hyperacidic environment. The component of pain is present, but the intensity of pain is more in your gastric ulcer. In fact, the pain is seen after two to three hours of consuming food in deodal ulcer for a simple fact that the gastric emptying time is two to three hours. You eat by the time it goes to deodorant, it takes two to three hours and it will be milder in form. Whereas here it is associated with food pain. As soon as the patient eats, the transit from the oral cavity from the esophagus into stomach is negligible. You eat, it drops, it drops, it erodes the oral ulcer. Erosion is going to cause severe pain. Now, the pain in the duodenal ulcer is after 2 to 3 hours, right? It will be mild. So, imagine you had lunch at 2 o'clock at 5.36 in the evening. You feel a bit of discomfort, a mild pain. What is, your mis what is your understanding? You think that this is not duodenal ulcer. You think it is probably a hunger pain. Now, in order to compensate for that, the appetite in duodenal ulcer increases. Huh? The appetite in gastric ulcer falls. Now, because appetite increases, there will be weight gain. Whereas in gastric ulcers, there is weight loss. Risk for hemorrhage is present huh, in both. But risk for hemorrhage is more in gastric ulcer. Remember, the most common source here is your gastroduodenal artery, right? Whereas the risk for perforation is more on duodenal ulcer when compared to the gastric ulcers. Remember, it is the anterior ulcer that perforates or the anteriorly located ulcer that perforates when compared to the posteriorly located ulcer. So it is the anterior ulcer that usually perforate. Duodenal ulcers are never pre-malignant, whereas gastric ulcers are considered to be pre-malignant. That is why whenever we come across gastric ulcer, I will always take biopsy. I will always take biopsy, right? So that's in the context which is present here. Now, in terms of investigation on duodenal ulcer, this is your duodenal ulcer. Let's say this happens to be your duodenal ulcer. This is your gastric ulcer. In duodenal ulcer, I will only perform an upper GI endoscopy. I will only perform an upper GI endoscopy. Whereas in gastric ulcers, I will do an upper GI endoscopy. But along with that, I will also take biopsy because I know it is pre-malignant in status. Now, in order to evaluate for H. pylori, you have the buffet of investigations that are here. Now, the question is, what is the investigation of choice for H. pylori? The answer is urease assay test. What is the gold standard? You cannot beat culture. Culture is best. Which test is do, done to analyze the response to treatment or the prognosis, the breath urease test? It is done to evaluate the response to treatment. It is done to evaluate the response and treatment. In simple words, uh, it predicts the prognosis uh, whether it's responding. Now, of all the investigations, which is the most cost effective, sasta, cheap, the cost effective is stool antigen. This is the most cost effective test. This is the most cost effective test, right? On either way, whenever you're going to do for H. pylori testing. You need to ask the patient to stop the PPI for two weeks and antibiotics four weeks prior for assessment. Otherwise, the result will not be substantial. So the management, you can go ahead with triple therapy as well as quadruple therapy. The idea is to decrease the acid secretion. So we'll go ahead with proton pump inhibitors. Along with PPI, I will give clarithromycin and a broad spectrum antibiotic. That will be a penicillin group or a metronidazole. But the problem in triple therapy, you're not addressing pain. It hurts. So how do you address it? So I will give ulcer protective drugs like bismuth or sucral fit. You can use bismuth or sucral fit that will form a <coughs> emulsive coat, hence decreasing the erosion and the component of pain. Right? Clear? Chalo. So this is in terms of your peptic ulcer disease. Now, in terms of intestinal obstruction, I have two disorders which are present. Number one is going to be intersusception. Number two is going to be volvulus. Right? Intersusception, if I talk in general, uh, by definition, if this is the proximal end, this is the distal end. It is the proximal end of the bowel. 
इट इज दॉक्सिमल एंड ऑफ बावल टेलीस्कोपिंग इट इज द प्रोक्सिमल एंड ऑफ द बावल टेलीस्कोपिंग इन टू the distal end now if you question me why does this happen the reason why it happens is the direction of peristalsis is from a proximal to distal so it will follow that line of peristalsis hence causing interception what is volvulus it's a loop of intestine it's the loop of intestine that rotates around its own axis that rotates around its own axis that is going to rotate around its own axis so this is the axis of rotation uh, that will result in development of volvulus now not everybody is going to develop intersusception no? so what is the problem behind it so intersusception is seen commonly in those patients uh, who are going to have something called as lead point right so i'll talk about the concept of lead point it's the point from where the intersusception starts now the part of the bowel that has gone inside you see this part of the bowel that has gone inside this is called as intersusceptum this is what we call it as the intersusceptum and the part of the bowel that accommodates this is called as intersuscipiens this is what we call it as intersuscipiens right now when you talk about the lead point it is going to be age specific in age less than 1 year it is your hypertrophized pears patches it is your hypertrophized it is your hypertrophized pears patches that acts as lead point in children the most common lead point is your meckel's diverticulum in adult the most common uh, lead point is going to be your polyps right on the other hand when you come down to volvulus now volvulus per se it is usually associated with long floppy mesentery redundant sigmoid colon constipation elderly patients it rotates if i say what is the most common type of rotation normally you have clockwise anti clockwise it is going to be anti clockwise and if i say what is the most common site the most common site for volvulus is going to be your sigmoid colon it is going to be your sigmoid colon this is the most common site that you will see if i say intersusception what is the most common site of intersusception in children so remember in children i see that is ileum going into colon ileo colic most common site of intersusception in adult in adult it is going to be colo colic is going to be colo colic so the colon goes into the colon segment right that's your colo colic now on terms of see both of them will have dynamic intestinal obstructive properties your intersusception will present to you a small intestinal obstruction volvulus will present to you as a large intestinal obstruction so when you do a barium enema right what are the findings that you can see you can see a classical claw sign is being seen across here so on enema you will see presence of claw sign but if i say what is the investigation of choice in children for children the answer is ultrasound the investigation of choice in adult for the diagnosis it is going to be your ct abdomen it is going to be your ct abdomen now when you do an ultrasound in the ultrasound you see there is a concentric circle that is present uh, circle number 1 circle number 2 circle number 3 and this is what we call it as the target sign this is what we call it as the target sign on an ultrasound whereas when you go down towards the volvulus you see there is a nice coffee bean sign on an x ray you will see a coffee bean sign a classical coffee bean sign that is going to be seen and when you do an enema as you see uh, this image looks like as if a bird is waiting to catch its prey so this is what we called as the bird of prey sign this is your bird of prey sign this is your bird of prey sign that you see in your enema right 
the management for interception in children i will first try to go ahead with anema this anema is initially preferred it is preferred with air then you can go ahead with uh, barium that's the first one if it fails to resolve then i am going to take for exploratory laparotomy i'll take the patient for exploratory laparotomy milk the segment out see if the segment is viable if it is fine if it is not viable you have to do a resection and astomosis if it is viable look for lead point if there's meckel's diverticulum go with resection and astomosis in the volvulus the step number one is try a colonoscopic detorsion if this doesn't work out take the patient for exploratory laparotomy in the exploratory laparotomy do the same thing do a detorsion see if it is viable if it is viable do a diversion colostomy if it is non-viable do a temporary colostomy called as hartman surgery yes somebody is pointed out correct in interception especially in children you will see a finding that is presence of red current jelly stool right now presence of red current jelly stool in interception you will see presence of red current jelly stool now this red current jelly stool is basically an indication of resolved intersusception absolutely correct right so these are the objectives in terms of intersusception and volvulus one of the most repeatedly asked questions in your exam is your inflammatory bowel disease now in the inflammatory bowel disease i'll be talking about two components you have the crohn's disease and the ulcerative colitis now let's talk about the comparative data between both two in terms of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, both of them have a bimodial presentation. One you can see between 20 to 30 years. The second shift that you will see or the second peak that you will see is about 50 years, right? So either 20 to 30 years or you will see after 50 to 60 years. So there is a bimodal presentation. Same for ulcerative colitis. The first peak is between 20 to 30 years. If this misses out, the next peak is between or about 50 to 60 years of presentation right now who is more likely to get affected remember in Crohn's we say females are more likely to get affected than males ulcerative colitis has more more male prediction when compared to females right is there any specific risk factors for Crohn's it is going to be smoking it is going to be smoking history of tuberculosis history of tuberculosis is very important then there is dietary risk factor that is there right it is also associated with dietary risk factor per se it is a hyper immune response it is a hyper immune response this is your hyper immune response right whereas there is no specific risk factor because this condition is autoimmune your ulcerative colitis is usually an autoimmune disorder. Is there anything protective for Crohn's? No, but ulcerative colitis, yes, we have protective finding. That is smoking is found to be protective and appendicectomy. And appendicectomy is found to be protective for ulcerative colitis. There is no specific gene in your ulcerative colitis, but here it is associated with nod 2 and card 15 it is associated with nod 2 and card 15 there are two genes which are commonly associated with your inflammatory bowel disease now what are the sites involved now the beauty of it is crohn's disease it starts involving from the oral cavity it starts involving from the oral cavity to the anal canal it is going to start involving from the oral cavity to the anal canal. Now, one good thing about it is, it is not, sorry, uh, not good thing. It is one characteristic feature that you'll see. It will not have a continuous involvement. It will have skip lesions. That means uh, it is not going to involve in a continuous manner here and there patchy fan that you'll see across here. The most important, or I could say this is the star point, right? This is going to be associated with transmural involvement. 
when i say a transmural involvement this is the mucosa that is present then you have the submucosa you have the inner circular muscles then you have the outer longitudinal muscles and the last one that you have is your serosa when the crohn's disease start it starts from the mucosa it goes into submucosa from there to circular it involves the longitudinal muscles pierces the serosa and the serosa is also going to get involved because there's a transmural involvement anything that you can think about a transmural involvement complication occur because when it heals it fibrosis fibrosis will cause stricture stricture will cause obstruction so obstructions are more common with Crohn's disease. Second important finding, it can result in perforation. Why? Because transmural involvement, no. And peritonitis associated with that is more common in Crohn's disease. Second, it can result in development of fistulas between one bowel segment to another called as internal fistulization. That is only possible because there's a transmural involvement, again common in Crohn's disease, right? So these are the findings that you have to see. So involvement of oral cavity to anal canal skip lesions, transmural involvement, and anal involvement is very common here. When you talk about the anal involvement, in the anal involvement, you will see presence of multiple perianal fistulas. Presence of multiple perianal fistula. Presence of multiple perianal fistula. On the other hand, the ulcerative colitis is restricted to large intestine. <clears throat> it is going to be associated, or if I say it is going to have a continuous lesion. It will have a continuous, like there is no skip lesion. It involves only mucosa. Max to max, it will involve submucosa, not beyond that. Right? Here, anal involvement is uncommon. In fact, anal involvement in ulcerative colitis is extremely rare. And you will notice if I say what is the overall most common site for ulcerative colitis, the answer is going to be rectum. Whereas if I say what is the most common site for Crohn's disease, the answer is going to be terminal ileum. It is going to be a terminal ileum. That's the comparative data that you need to have. They go rectal sparing in Crohn's nowadays we don't say it. Yes, earlier we used to say rectal sparing, but now it has been confined or it is pretty much clear that in Crohn's rectum can also be involved, right? So rectal sparing is an old phenomenon. We don't characterize by this. In Crohn's patient, because there is inflammation of mucosa, some mucosa, they'll be associated with diarrhea. Along with diarrhea, they'll be associated with malabsorption. Along with malabsorption, because of strictures, they can present to you with obstruction as well as they can present to you with pelvic abscess because of perforation and it can present in development of internal fistulas as explained to you before. On the other hand, when you talk about in terms of ulcerative colitis, in ulcerative colitis patient, because there is only mucosa, submucosa involved, it will have diarrhea. The blood vessels are present in submucosa. This will bleed. It will result in hematochesia, which is very consistent finding, which is present here. So diarrhea with hematochesia is going to be seen in your ulcerative colitis. And in fact, you can have stools going more than 10. If a patient has more than 10 episodes of stools, more than 10 episodes of stools with toxic megacolon. This is what we call it as fulminant colitis. This is what we call it as definition of fulminant colitis. This is what we call it as fulminant colitis. Now, what is the characteristic feature radiologically? I know you, I hope you are able to see this structural sites here. These are what we call it as the string signs of Cantor. This is what we call it as the string sign of Cantor. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, because there's a loss of hostration, uh, that colonic hostrations are they flattened out. Why? Because of involvement of mucosa, some mucosa that is atrophized. Hence, this is what we call it as the lead pipe appearance. So lead pipe appearance is seen in your ulcerative colitis. What is the gross appearance that you see in Crohn's? You see this. What is this? This is your cobblestone mucosa. 
whereas here you see as if a bear has taken its claw and scraped it uh, and this is what we call it as the bear claw sign this is what we call as bear claw sign here you can see there is severe colitis that is present there is severe colitis and that in a continuous manner if you see carefully here these are the sites uh, presenting of pseudo polyps so pseudo polyps is a character these are not true polyps they are just inflammatory granulomas that are converting into polyps they are non-caseating non granulomas and that presence indicates of ulcerative colitis absolutely spot on now inter extra intestinal manifestations are important what i'm not going to talk about all the one which has been there i'll talk about one which is going to be relevant for our discussion now number one in ulcerative colitis there'll be erythema nodosum there is erythema nodosum there is pyoderma gangrenosum there is pyoderma gangrenosum there's your pyoderma gangrenosum it is associated with uveitis it is also associated with iritis it is also associated with iritis so you have erythema nodosum pyoderma gangrenosum uveitis iritis these are the extra intestinal manifestations that you see here ulcerative colitis it is associated with uh, polyarthritis so it is associated with arthritis it is associated with sacroilitis it is associated with same component it will be associated with erythema nodosum it will be associated with pyoderma gangrenosum right so these are the features now in crohn's it is erythema nodosum which is common in ulcerative colitis it is arthritis that is going to be more common right now the management initial management for both of them it is going to be steroids that's the first line management along with steroids you can give monoclonal antibodies this will be here if it does not respond you have to do a conservative surgery you will never do a curative surgery you will only perform a conservative surgery in crohn's disease because more you meddle more is the problem whereas here if it is not responding the surgery of choice will be total proctal colectomy with ileal with ileal pouch or the ileal j pouch we have the ileal j pouch with ileal j pouch anal anastomosis with ileal j pouch anastomosis what do you mean by this this is the esophagus this is the stomach this is the duodenum this is the small intestine we have re removed the entire colon i have removed the colon along with the rectum so what am i left out with i am only left out with the anal canal which is present now if I take the ileum and directly connect it to the anal canal, there will be so much amount of effluent that is going to come where the patient has to defecate frequently. There's increase in frequency of defecation. There's no reservoir. So in order to create the reservoir, I am going to take the ileum and I'm going to turn the ileum on its own axis and close it from here. And I'm going to create a reservoir by making a suture here. And this entire component will become one single reservoir. And then we will go and anastomose with the anal canal so what will happen is all these stools that are going to come all these stools that is going to come it is going to come and stay here it will become like a reservoir and then once it fills up then the patient will be able to defecate that creation of reservoir is what we call it as j pouch so total proctal colectomy with ileal j pouch anal anastomosis is the surgery of choice remember surgery in ulcerative colitis is done with a curative intent whereas surgery in crohn's disease is done with palliative intent those are the components that you have to remember <clears throat> now another very important discussion point so far any questions guys quick feedback any questions am i missing anything quick 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 in last five seven doubt her last time five to seven coaching confused 
कपिल बेटा इट डजेंट मैटर कि आप कहाँ से पढ़ रहे हो बिकॉज एवरीबडी जो भी जहाँ भी पढ़ा रहा है देर एट द बेस्ट द ओनली थिंग इज ना एक बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट एडवाइज है कि जब आपने अपना प्रिपरेशन शुरू किया है ऑलवेज स्टिक टू दी सोर्स मटेरियल एक पॉइंट एक मटेरियल लेने का वो मटेरियल आपको अपने आप से एक ही सवाल पूछना है कि मैं ये तीन बार रिवाइज कर सकता हूँ कि नहीं कर सकता अगर बोलता है दिल कि हाँ कर सकता है रख ले मटेरियल एंड फॉलो इट ब्लाइंडली आगे पीछे नहीं देखना ठीक है अदरवाइज डू नॉट ट्राई टू जम्प सोर्सेस ठीक है और लास्ट मिनट में जम्प करेगा ना तो फोमो हो जाएगा दैट इज यू नो यू फील लाइक फियर ऑफ मिसिंग आउट और कुछ नहीं होने वाला स्टिक टू दी पॉइंट रीड प्रिसाइजली रिपीटेडली एक बार पढ़ने से कुछ नहीं होता बेटा दो बार से भी कुछ नहीं होता तीसरी बार तो समझ में आता चौथी बार याद होता है पांचवी बार को रिवीजन बोलते हैं ठीक है सो यू हैव टू बी इन दैट कॉन्टेक्स्ट सर हाउ डू डिफरेंशिएट स्मॉल इंटेस्टीन बेटा डिफरेंशिएशन ऑफ स्मॉल इंटेस्टीन नो व्हेन यू टॉक अबाउट इट यू हैव टू डिफरेंशिएट बिटवीन द जेजुनम एंड द आइलियम जेजुनम और आइलियम को यू कैन डिफरेंशिएट फ्रॉम इट्स मिसेंट्रिक बॉर्डर यू विल नोटिस दैट इन योर जेजुनम you will have longer vasa recta and minimum arcade whereas in ileum you will see multiple branches multiple arcades are formed and you will see there are shorter vessels which are present they are called as shorter vasa recta so this is your ileum so intraoperatory jejunum and ileum are differentiated based upon their vascular supply theek hai clear chalo बेटा डिओडनम विल बी फिक्स्ड जेजुनम इज दिस आइलियम इज दैट क्लियर और कोई सवाल और कोई प्रॉब्लम एनीथिंग एल्स किसी को कुछ और पूछना है सो इन बिटवीन द टॉपिक आई विल टेक वन और टू मिनट्स ब्रेक लाइक दिस ताकि विल बी एबल टू इंटरेक्ट विद ईच अदर कोई भी सवाल कोई भी बाय इमेजिंग ओके If the presence, I'll show you the jejunal imaging. There is something called as valvulae inconventae, where you have these hostations which are present. That will be jejunum. No features is going to be ileum. Duodenum will always cross the midline. As simple as that. ठीक है. बेटा कॉन्सेप्ट क्लियर होना चाहिए अपने आप सब समझ में आता है ठीक है बॉडी है यार हम वी आर नॉट ट्राइंग टू रीड समथिंग विच इज नॉट एक्जिस्ट हम ऐसे कोई पढ़ ही नहीं रहे जो हमारे पास है ही नहीं सब कुछ अंदर ही है ठीक है थोड़ा इंटरेस्ट और थोड़ी जिज्ञासा और कुछ नहीं. चले कंटिन्यू और कोई सवाल और कोई शक चलो सो लेट्स कंटिन्यू वी हैव द पॉलिप सिंड्रोम राइट सीकल वॉल्वल सिग्मॉइड वॉल्वल डिफरेंशिएट इन इमेजिंग मंसूर बेटा When you talk about cecal valvulus, first of all, cecal valvulus itself is a misnomer. Cecum इतना छोटा होता है कि वो अपने आप घूम ही नहीं सकता, ठीक है? तो जब भी cecum घूमेगा ना, थोड़ा सा terminal ileum और ascending colon साथ में लेगा, it is called as ileocecocolic valvulus. Now, sigmoid valvulus जब घूमेगा, उसका जो axis होगा, the axis will be like this. You will see the bubble will be formed here. So originating from the left. एंड यू सी दी एंटायर जो कॉफी बीन का ओरियंटेशन है वो राइट साइड ऊपर की तरफ होगा सीकल वॉल्वल उल्टा होगा उल्टा राइट इफ यू सी दी बब सी ऑरिजिनेटिंग फ्रॉम द लेफ्ट लोअर क्वार्रेंट एंड द कॉफी बीन इज पॉइंटिंग टूवर्ड्स द राइट अपर इट इज योर सिग्मॉइड वॉल्वल अगर उल्टे डायरेक्शन में है तो सीकल वॉल्वल एज सिंपल एज दैट ठीक है क्लियर चले लेट्स मूव ऑन so we are talking about the polyp syndrome so kya hai polyp syndrome we have fap gardner syndrome turcot syndrome peutz jagger syndrome what is the pattern of inheritance all of them are autosomal dominant disorder right so all these are your autosomal dominant disorder including your peutz jagger syndrome what is the gene fap is associated with apc gene mutation gardner syndrome is also associated with apc gene mutation Turcot is also APC gene mutation. Peutz Jagger syndrome is your STK11 gene mutation. What is the chromosome here? Chromosome number five, chromosome number five, chromosome number five. It is not five. It is 19. What are the features of FAP? Remember, in order to call it as FAP, the most common site where you see the polyps is going to be rectum. That is the first thing. What is the criteria? The minimum number of polyps should be more than or equal to 100. if these are not there it cannot be considered as fap second important factor that you need to know they are present in rectum and they are associated with 100% malignant transformation so they have 100% malignant potential 
the management whenever you have a patient with FAP. Number one, I will screen the family members for APCG invitation. But here I will do same as we did for your ulcerative colitis. That is going to be your total total proctal colectomy. Total proctal colectomy with ileal J pouch anal anastomosis. with ileal j pouch anal anastomosis this is what is the component in your fap in the fap right right so in terms of gardner syndrome the components can be remembered with the help of the following components this is what we call it as a mnemonic as for fed in for fed f stands for fap familiar adenovirus polyposis o is your osteoma R is your retinal pigmented epithelium. We have retinal pigmented epithelium. It is your retinal pigmented epithelium. Another F stands for fibroma. It is your epidermoid cyst or epidermal cyst and the desmoid tumor. and the desmoid tumor. These are the components of your Gardner syndrome. What is Turcot syndrome? Turcot syndrome is a component of familial adenomatous polyposis with brain tumors. FAP with brain tumors. This is what we call it as the Turcot syndrome. When we talk about the brain tumors, we have tumors like gliomas and medulloblastoma gliomas and medulloblastoma right so these are the components uh, that will be present in your turcot syndrome pute zagger syndrome in pute zagger remember p j and h what does this mean p stands for it's a disorder which is associated with polyposis uh, with uh, pigmentation it's a disorder which is associated with polyposis and pigmentation uh, what type of pigmentation are we talking about here the pigmentation is going to be your mucocutaneous pigmentation this is your mucocutaneous this is going to be your mucocutaneous pigmentation this is your mucocutaneous pigmentation so when you talk about polyposis where do you see now that is why your JNH, J is the site, the most common site for polyp here is going to be jejunum. What is the most common type of polyp? That H, the most common type of polyp that you will see here is going to be your hamartomus polyp. It is going to be your hamartomus polyp, right? So that is your pute zagger syndrome, right? All these cancer familial syndromes are absolutely important. I try to justify them in a single go. That's what you need to have. Just a quick glance. Have your concepts clear and that is more than enough. Okay. Moving on to the next one. Now, this is where I want your feedback. Ho gaya, jitna padna tha, pad liya, bahut ho gaya. Abhi time nahi hai. Okay. Recall ka time hai. Fata fat batao. Whatever comes to your mind. So, we have a couple of lists that I always give my students to revise before the exam. This, they go is list mission a direct question, right? Like in ye list ka hurry topic will be, uh, you know, it's an eye opener. Jesse up what topic are in socho gay, you should start thinking everything, and this is more to boost your confidence. Take Are you ready, guys? Chale, shuru kare. Now, list number one. So, what is the list says? It's a disorder and the most common site. So, tracheoesophageal fistula, what is the most common type you have? The most common type that you see is your type C. You see that is type C. Ecclesia cardia. What is the most common site? It is going to be your lower one third of the esophagus. Zenkers diverticulum. It is seen on the cervical esophagus. It is seen on the cervical esophagus. 
esophageal cancer it is seen in the middle one third of the esophagus barrett's esophagus it is seen in the lower one third webb in the plummer robinson syndrome it is seen in the upper or the cervical esophagus it is the upper or the cervical esophagus is the most common site for webb in the plummer robinson syndrome right now you have borhaf syndrome borhaf syndrome is on the lower one third and that too on the posterior surface of the esophagus mallory we stare the most common site for the tear remember it is cardia not the g junction galti nahi karna theek hai then your peptic ulcer disease i told you most common is the first part of duodenum gastric ulcers angularis in cisura intersusception in children agar bachcho mein puch lega children mein kya hai it is ileo colic adult mein kya hai abhi to bataya tha that is your colo colic do not make these mistakes that is your first half right kicking on to the next part what is the next part volvulus most common kahan pe hai it is going to be your sigmoid colon not your patient sigmoid colon diverticulosis again most common on sigmoid colon polyps the most common site for polyp overall is going to be rectum tb stricture kahan pe milega terminal ileum mein milega typhoid perforation kahan milega terminal ileum mein milega ulcerative colitis kahan milega rectum mein milega crohn's disease kahan milega terminal ileum mein milega right Hirschsprung disease कहाँ मिलेगा Rectum में मिलेगा The most common site for Hirschsprung disease is rectum. Ischemic colitis, ischemic colitis वहीं मिलेगा जहाँ पे blood supply कम होगी कहाँ पे blood supply कम होगी Which part of the large intestine is also called as the watershed area? Quick feedback. Where do you have the watershed area? Two sites. One is your Griffith point, another one is Sudak point. वहाँ where is your Griffith point? It is at this plantar flexor. Sudak, su Sudak. That means it is S for Sudak. S for sigmoid colon. So most common site is going to be your splenic flexure. फिर पूछ लेगा यार splenic flexure में अगर ischemic colitis होगा तो X-ray में क्या finding मिलेगी? On an X-ray what do you find? You will find thumb print sign, right? So these are the common that see superior mesenteric artery syndrome, SMA syndrome. अच्छा पहले तो SMA syndrome कब होता है? When the takeoff angle is less than 20 degrees. तो क्या होगा? Superior mesenteric artery originates and goes above the third part of the duodenum. When the angle is not proper, if it if this is my aorta, this is the superior mesenteric artery. Aorta superior mesenteric artery, this is the duodenum. ठीक है? The aorta, this superior mesenteric artery should go at a certain angle. Why? Because there's a fat part here. If there is loss of fat, this collapses. If it collapses, it compresses the duodenum. Which part of the duodenum is compressed? It is the third part of the duodenum is compressed. Acute mesenteric ischemia. The acute mesenteric ischemia ka most common site kya hai? It is going to be occluding the middle colic artery. It is the middle colic artery. Large intestinal malignancy. The answer is rectosigmoid. Rectum is more when compared to sigmoid. Single best answer will be your rectum. Fair enough. Perforation in peptic ulcer disease, the most common site is going to be duodenum. Hemorrhage is going to be in the peptic ulcer disease, is going to stomach, that is gastric. Most common source of bleeding, gastroduodenal artery. Fistula in ano, most common type, it is your intersphincteric type. It is your intersphincteric type according to your Parks classification. Hemorrhoids, most common, it is your internal hemorrhoids. Internal hemorrhoids are more common and they are primary more common. That is 3, 7 and 11 o'clock position. It is the 3, 7 and 11 o'clock position. Anal cancer, it is seen below the dentate line. It is seen below the dentate line. So this is your list number one. add Anything else that you want to add on list number one? Anything specific? Are we missing out anything? Can we add? Can we add? Can we add? Nothing that I can think about. Moving to list number two. What do you have list number two? GI malignancy is chemotherapy. GO, right? Very, very important. So, what is the chemo agent in esophageal cancer? It is your ECF. ECF kya hai? E is your epirubacin. Right? Along with epirubacin. C is what? Cisplatin. Along with cisplatin, what do you have? F is your 5 fluorouracil. Stomach cancer, it is going to be ECF. So, same you have epirubicin, cisplatin, 5 fluorouracil. Small intestinal adenocarcinoma, it is fall fox. 
एफ ओ एल स्टैंड फॉर फोलेनिक एसिड इट इज योर फोलेनिक एसिड प्लस एफ इज योर फाइव फ्लोरो यूरासल प्लस ओ स्टैंड फॉर ऑक्स दैट इज ऑक्साली प्लाटिन राइट वेन इट कम्स डाउन टू लार्ज इंटेस्टाइन एडिनो कार्सनोमा यू कैन गो अ हेड विथ फॉल फॉक्स और दॉल फॉर वेरी नाउ इन दिस एवरीथिंग इज सेम you have folinic acid you have five fluoroacyl you have oxali platin in iri it is your irinotecin it is your irinotecin rectal cancer again it is going to be same fall fox or fall for viri so it is going to be in the same context anal cancer <clears throat> we're talking about the squamous cell variety for squamous cell carcinoma we do something or we give something called as the negros regime what is your negros regime it is 5 fluoro uracil with meta mycin c with meta mycin c with radiotherapy it is chemo radiation negros is your chemo radiation can you tell me where else meta mycin c is given locally any idea where you give meta mycin c locally meta mycin c locally fatafat 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 kahan doge you will give it in hypex in your mucinous adenocarcinoma of the appendix to usme kya karte hain hypex dete na hypex kya heated intra peritoneal chemotherapy kaun sa chemo doge meta mycin c doge heated kyu bolte kyunki aap 40 degree temperature pe doge that is your hypex that is to be given for gist <coughs> what is the drug of choice for gist that is it is going to be imatinib if it is resistant to imatinib if it is resistant to imatinib then you will go sunitinib then we will go ahead and give sunitinib for hcc what do we give for hcc we have sorafenib we give the sorafenib for cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer we have gemcitabine we have the gemcitabin based chemotherapy pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma is also going to be your gemcitabin with cisplatin that is your platinum based compound can also be given but predominantly it is going to be your gemcitabin that is your list number 2 now what do you have list number 3 in the gist number 3 we have the gi malignancies and the margin for resection you have two margin for resection that is proximal and distal those who don't understand let's look at the concept let's say this is the gi lumen right in the gi lumen let's say there is a tumor so this is the tumor that has been developed across here so what i'll do is i will take the upper extent of the tumor and the lower extent of the tumor before this is proximal after this is distal whatever margin you take above the tumor is proximal margin and whatever margin that you take below the tumor this is your distal margin so this is the concept of proximal and distal margin now when you have esophageal cancers what is your proximal margin of resection that is going to be 10 cm distal margin is going to be 5 cm for stomach it is 5 cm proximal 5 cm distal for small intestinal adenocarcinoma 5 cm proximal 5 cm distal for large intestinal adenocarcinoma 5 cm proximal 5 cm distal for your rectal cancer it is going to be your 5 cm proximal but 2 cm distal so this skewed data that you have to remember 10 cm this skewed data that you have to remember it is your 10 cm proximal for esophageal cancer and 2 cm distal for rectal cancer right so these are the proximal and the distal margins that you have to make sure that you remove it across theek okay? hai so this is your list number 3 what is your list number 4 you have disorders and how would you like to manage guys i need an active feedback i can't have you guys sleep across this is about active recall i want your involvement without your involvement maza hi nahi hai yaar i want it to be involved i want you guys to participate bolo kya hai अकलेशिया कार्डिया के लिए क्या करोगे अकलेशिया कार्डिया के लिए सर्जरी में हेलर्स कार्डियो मायोटमी करेंगे इट इज आर्डियो मायोटमी ठीक है सिर्फ मायोटमी नहीं बोलना है यू विल से कार्डियो मायोटमी फॉर डिफ्यूज इसोफेजल स्पॉजम आई विल डू लॉन्ग आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट सर्जिकल मैनेजमेंट सो बी क्लियर इट इज अ लॉन्ग इसोफेजियल 
will perform a long esophageal myotomy can be performed zenker's diverticulum if it is more than 3 cm we can do an endoscopic dolmen's procedure or the dolmen surgery for esophageal cancer we have three techniques we have iver lewis we have mckeoins and oringers and needless to tell you oringers is now the most common preferred method for chps we have ramsteads pyloro myotomy it is your ramsteads pyloro myotomy perforation in peptic ulcer disease what surgery do we do we do graham's omental patching we do a graham's omental patching so this is like a puncture patch that you're going to put for peptic ulcer disease we will either go ahead with triple or quadruple therapy triple or quadruple therapy if it does not work out if it is the ordinal ulcer you'll go with vigotomy if it is your gastric ulcer you can go ahead with bilroth 1 or bilroth 2 for grd i would prefer nissen's 360 degrees posterior fundoplication it is your fundoplication that is your 360 degrees posterior fundoplication for a d1 stricture you have heineken you have the heineken mucleids pyloroplasty it is your heineken mucleids pyloroplasty for duodenal atresia you will go duodeno dudnostomy we'll do a duodeno dudnostomy for jejunal atresia we will perform jejuno jejunostomy we'll perform jejuno jejunostomy for ulcerative colitis total proctal colectomy with ileal j pouch anal anastomosis that is your total proctal colectomy with ileal j pouch anal anastomosis diverticulosis will go with elective sigmoid resection elective sigmoid resection for diverticulosis then you have fap for fap it is going to be same total proctal colectomy with ileal j pouch anal anastomosis rectal prolapse remember we have Rebstein surgery then you have the Thioch wiring then you have the Preichmann Goldberg surgery remember all these three Rebstein's Rebstein's is going to be abdominal approach Thioch is your perineal approach Preichmann Goldberg is again your abdominal approach that you have Hirschsprung disease, you will do pull through surgeries. What are the examples of pull through surgeries? You have the name, no? We have the Duhamel. We have the Swenson. And we have the Soas. Right? Now, hemorrhoids, if you are doing an open hemorrhoidectomy, you have the Milligan Morgan surgery. We have the Milligan Morgan surgery. Another one that you have is your Ferguson's surgery. Another one is Ferguson's surgery. Adenocarcinoma of the anal canal, I will do abdominal perineal resection. Like it is more for me is like an exercise, right? Chalo, aapke saath thodi mein bhi kar leto. So this is your list number four in the GIT. Chalo. So Let's move down to my favorite topic. That is going to be liver. Abhita, koi sawal? Any questions? Any feedback? Koi problem? <clears throat> but a nuisance cannot be done as a prophylaxis for ecclesia. Ecclesia may already there is spasm down there, right? There is already failure of relaxation. If you do nuisance, no, it will grip more. What you're trying to tell you is when you do a when you do a myotomy, right, in your ecclesia cardia, that will cause GRD. 
in order to prevent GRD, I will always do a partial fundal plication, which is also called as Heller door surgery. Door is your anterior partial fundal plication. अभी एग्जाम के लिए इतना जरूरत नहीं है अभी जितना जरूरत है उतना ही पड़ेंगे ठीक है लेट्स नॉट ओवर बर्डन आर सेल्फ ठीक है अभी बहुत टाइम है एक बार निकाल लो अपना एफ एग्जाम फिर आगे आना अरे पीजी में पीजी उसके बाद रेसिडेंसी में अरे बहुत है ठीक है सीखने की चाह होनी चाहिए हम यहीं पर कोई टेंशन नहीं है एनी अदर क्वेश्चन गाइस कुछ और कैन यू मूव ऑन क्विक फीडबैक Quick feedback, quick feedback. Chalo. Let's moving down with liver. Okay. Now, first is the terminologies that are to be used for liver resection. Now, in order to understand the terminologies used for liver resection, let's understand how the liver has been categorized. Let's say this is the representation of the liver. I'll be using the cheesecake analogy to understand the basic component of the liver. Now, basically, the liver is divided into various components. The first one, the liver is divided into two equal halves, and that is done with the help of a line that is present. And this is what we call it as the Cantel's line. Now, the Cantel's line is actually a groove that is running right in the middle of the liver that is present. Right? It divides the river into the right hemi liver and the left hemi liver then the other components which are responsible for dividing the liver they are your hepatic veins you have the left hepatic vein you have the middle hepatic vein and then you have the right hepatic vein all these hepatic veins when they drain they drain a specific segment as they present across here you can see they are draining light across here then you will see the hepatic veins have divided the liver into various sections right so this is one section this is another section this is third section this is the fourth section right so we say the section number one is present on the left lateral side so left lateral section section number two is your left medial section section number three is your right anterior section number four is right posterior so that is how it is divided now the blood supply the blood supply is given by your portal vein so this is your portal supply right so the portal vein runs transversely and supplies to the entire extent of the liver so the criteria on which you divide the liver into various segments is on the basis of the portal vein supply and the hepatic vein drainage now you see this area of the liver is now being depicted as one segment this is another segment that you see then you see there is one more segment that you have created here there's one more segment that is here you see this is one segment of the liver the posterior you see another segment of the liver then you have one more component that is present across here and then you see one more component of the liver which is here right so this is how the liver is divided into various segments so if i number them this is your segment number two this is your three this is your 4a this is your 4b this is segment 5 this is segment 6 this is segment 7 it is your segment 8 right so this is the orientation of the segments that you need to keep where is segment number one for a segment number one to understand if you flip the liver let's say this is the posterior surface of the liver that you have on the posterior surface of the liver you see a blood vessel that is going that is your inferior vena cava now at the same point you will also notice uh, <clears throat> the portal vein is going to enter across this point <clears throat> this is the portal vein that is entering at this particular point now the part of the liver that is between the portal vein and the ivc this entire component this is your segment number one which is also referred to as the caudate lobe now caudate lobe is not a small lobe it is quite big it is occupying almost the entire posterior surface starting all the way from the ivc it starts all the way from the ivc's groove and the portal in ct maybe you know you will identify like this only in the ct how will you find the segment present between the ivc and the portal vein so this happens to be your inferior vena cava this happens to be your portal vein right so this is how you divide the liver into various components now taking that into consideration let's go 
राइट हेमी लिवर और राइट हेपाटेक्टमी वॉट डू यू रिमूव वन टू थ्री फोर वॉट आर रिमूविंग फाइव सिक्स सेवन एट राइट लेफ्ट हेमी हेपाटेक्टमी योर टू थ्री फोर ए एंड फोर बी सो टू थ्री फोर ए एंड फोर बी इज रिमूव राइट एंटीरियर सेक्शन दिस इज द राइट एंटीरियर राइट एंटीरियर में वॉट डू हैव इन द राइट एंटीरियर सेक्शन यू सी दिस इज योर एंटीरियर सेगमेंट दैट इज प्रेजेंट दिस इज योर एंटीरियर सेगमेंट so what are you going to remove right anterior i'll remove 5 and 8 right posterior 6 and 7 left lateral 2 3 left medial 4 a and 4 b right trisection from the right side three sections section number 1 section number 2 section number 3 three sections from the right side you're going to remove so 5 6 7 8 plus 4 a 4 b If you do the left one, left trisectionectomy or see the right trisectionectomy or the trisectionectomy itself is called as extended hemihepatectomy. So here you have removed so this is your five, six, seven, eight. For left, it is going to be two, three, four, a, four, b. Anterior five and eight. right so these are the terminology and these are the components that you are going to remove as you move forward this are the components of your liver resection moving on we have again a very important component the infective disorders in liver now in the infective disorders in liver you have three categories pyogenic liver abscess amoebic and hydrated cyst what is the causative agent remember pyogenic liver abscess it is caused by bacteria whereas your amoebic liver abscess it is caused by your parasite whereas your hydrated cyst it is also caused by your parasite right now what is the causative agent for pyogenic liver abscess it is caused usually by e coli or klebsiella these are the brothers which always go together amoebic liver abscess caused by ant amoeba histolytica whereas hydrated cyst is caused by echinococcus granulosus it is a echinococcus granulosus how does this bacteria is reaching down to the liver who is pushing or who is assisting it to go to the liver remember the route of spread for pyogenic liver abscess right the most common is via the bile duct it is via the ascending route via the bile duct it is going to go if not bile duct then the second is portal vein if not hepatic artery if not the direct route of spread amoebic liver abscess how does amoeba get into the body it is by feco oral route of contamination it goes into the cecum and ascending colon forms a characteristic ulcer what is that characteristic ulcer it is going to form flask shaped ulcers right from there it goes into submucosa it gives its uh, you know uh, the infected cyst that is tetranucleate cyst via the portal circulation it is going to reach down to the liver hydrated cyst also reaches to the liver via the portal circulation pyogenic liver abscess is seen in age above 55 years whereas your amoebic liver abscess is seen between age 20 to 30 years whereas hydrated cyst is seen between 40 to 50 years even though hydrated cyst is going to enter or the echinococcus granulosus enters into the body at an early age the rate at which grows is very small that means very less that is 1 mm per year so by the time it becomes symptomatic it takes decade long time what is the sex now you have to tell me pyogenic liver abscess one more important component if i want to add here let's add risk factors right the risk factors for pyogenic liver abscess it is going to be alcohol and diabetes it is your alcohol and diabetes whereas here it is only alcohol as a risk factor Diab there is no diabetes as a risk factor now taking that into consideration who do you think is more likely to be affected in pyogenic liver abscess males or females i know you're seeing alcohol right alcohol stigma no so you'll say male unfortunately it is correct males are more commonly affected than females amoebic liver abscess you'll say again alcohol every time alcohol is not the reason aisa thodi nahi ki ladkiyan nahi peeti hain aajkal sab peete hain in fact aajkal ulta ho gaya i've seen husbands actually being sober and the wives have been drinking theek hai so you can the, the, there's a drift so i cannot say alcohol per se is male predominance here when you talk about amoebic liver abscess pehle ye socho amoeba body ke andar aata kaise how does it come 
इट कम्स बिकॉज ऑफ फीको ओरल रूट ऑफ कंटामिनेशन अभी फीको ओरल क्यों होगा जब अनहाइजेनिक फूड खाओगे अनहाइजेनिक फूड कहाँ मिलता है घर पे तो मिलेगा नहीं ठीक है बाहर खाओगे अब बाहर कौन ज्यादा खाता है बाहर खाने के लिए पैसे लगते हैं यू नीड फाइनेंशियल इंडिपेंडेंट हु इज मोर फाइनेंशियली इंडिपेंडेंट मेल्स और फीमेल्स सोचो अगर आंसर है तो बताओ तो आंसर कौन ज्यादा फाइनेंशियली फ्री है इट इज दी मेल्स सो हेंस अगेन मोर इज मोर मोर कॉमन इन मेल्स कम्पेयर टू फीमेल्स वेर एज अकाइनो कोकस ग्रैनुलोसिस में क्या इट इज बिकॉज ऑफ इम प्रॉपरली कुकड मीट इन्फेस्टेड विद अकाइनो कोकस ग्रैनुलोसिस दैट यू गोइंग टू इट प्रॉब्लम क्या इम प्रॉपरली कुक मीट तो किसको खाना बनाना नहीं आता मेल्स ऑफ फीमेल्स अभी आप बोलोगे सर अगेन मेल्स को खाना बनाना नहीं आता इसलिए वो इम प्रॉपरली कुकड मीट खाते नहीं नहीं बेटा हम हमेशा ना टेस्टी मीट ही खाएंगे ठीक है इट इज दी फीमेल्स विच कुक अब प्रॉब्लम ये होती ना कि करंट जनरेशन में ना ही मेल को खाना बनाना था ना ही फीमेल को ठीक है मान लो देर इज न्यूली मैरिड कपल एंड दोस्त न्यूली मैरिड कपल ना दिस गाय गोज एंड ब्रिंग्स ऑफ यू नो सम सार्ट ऑफ अ मीट एंड से आज खाना बना के खाएंगे तो वाइफ बोलते आज इंप्रेस करूंगी ठीक है बनाना आता नहीं है रखा ढंग से उबाला नहीं यू नो यू नॉट पुट इन ऑफ अमाउंट प्रेशर कुकर अब डिनर टेबल पर पड़ा हुआ है ठीक है अब खाओगे अब The girl would eat because उसने खाना बनाया वो थोड़ा फेंकेगी और आप खाओगे क्योंकि उसने बनाया तो दोनों मिल बांट के खाओगे तो क्या होगा मिल बांट के शेयर करोगे सो हियर मेल्स एंड फीमेल्स आर गोइंग टू बी इक्वली इफेक्टेड मोस्ट कॉमन साइट इन दिवर कौन से साइड पर जाएगा बेटा सारे के सारे इन्फेक्टेड डिजॉर्डर्स आर मोर कॉमन ऑन दी राइट हेमी लिवर You will see all these are more common on the right hemi liver. Bacteria जो है वो डेसिपेट करते हैं डेसिपेट करेंगे तो they will cause multiple lesions. So there will be presence with multiple. Whereas here parasites are confined, so they will have a solitary confinement. So there will be solitary lesions. Endemic status parasites का होता है bacteria का नहीं. So these two can be endemic. Your bacteria cannot be endemic. Is that clear? ठीक है Moving on, what are the clinical features? देखो जो बैक्टीरिया जाएगा तो अंदर इन्फ्लेमेशन करेगा इन्फ्लेमेशन करेगा तो वही है इन्फ्लेमेशन के वही फीचर्स है रूबर कैलर डॉलर टूम सेम फीचर्स है सो पेशेंट इज गोइंग टू हैव राइट हाइपोकॉन्ड्रिया पेन इट विल बी एसोसिएटेड विथ फीवर ऑल लिवर डिजॉर्डर आर एसोसिएटेड विथ एनोरेक्सिया एज वेल एज फटीक there will be anorexia as well as fatigue it will also be associated with obstructive jaundice the reason uh, you need to understand that the pyogenic liver abscess does not cause obstructive jaundice it is obstructive jaundice that actually takes into your pyogenic liver abscess what is the question sir classification kis kis topic ki karni chahiye please reply but the classifications for an fmg exam we'll talk about it <clears throat> not a whole set of classifications are required lekin if you talk about the crude classifications that you have to learn ek aapka classification hai that is about your bleeds that is a forest classification fir aapka peptic ulcer disease ka classification hai then i'll talk about varicose vein jo aage hai that is sieve classification very very important isko chhod ke agar time raha then you have classifications फॉर एग्जाम्पल इसी का अल्ट्रासाउंड हाइड्रेटिस का गर्बी क्लासिफिकेशन करके बॉसनाइ क्लासिफिकेशन एंड रीनल सिस्ट क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ लिवर इंजरीज एंड स्प्लेनिक इंजरीज दीज आर इंपॉर्टेंट ठीक है बेटा आज सब कुछ करा देंगे देर इज नथिंग विच इज गोइंग टू बी लेफ्ट बिहाइंड एवरी सिंगल थिंग आई एम गोइंग टू कवर विच इज विच एवर इज इंपॉर्टेंट एंड रेलिवेंट फॉर द एग्जाम ठीक है चलो राइट गाइस राइट चलो इन हियर मेन यू टॉक अबाउट द अमीबिक लिवर एप्सिस अमीबिक लिवर एप्सिस में भी पेन होगा अमीबिक लिवर एप्सिस में फीवर होगा यहां पे भी एनोरेक्सिया फटीक होगा लेकिन ऑब्स्ट्रक्टिव जॉन्डिस नहीं होगा ऑब्स्ट्रक्टिव जॉन्डिस इन पायोजेनिक लिवर एप्सिस बिकॉज़ ऑफ ऑब्स्ट्रक्टिव जॉन्डिस ऑब्स्ट्रक्टिव जॉन्डिस में क्या होता है द बाइल डक्ट इज गेटिंग ब्लॉक्ड सो इट अलाउज द बैक्टीरिया टू असेंड अप एज लॉन्ग एज द बाइल इज फ्लोइंग इट विल फ्लश द बैक्टीरिया अवे ब्लॉकेज विल अलाउ इट टू गो सो ऑब्स्ट्रक्टिव जॉन्डिस की वजह से पायोजेनिक लिवर एप्सिस होता है पायोजेनिक लिवर एप्सिस की वजह से ऑब्स्ट्रक्टिव जॉन्डिस नहीं होता इंपॉर्टेंट कांसेप्ट है ठीक है यहां पे आपको क्या मिलेगा देर विल बी हिस्ट्री ऑफ कोलाइटिस there will be presence of history of colitis patient would have been admitted in some ward few days or few weeks ago where severe colitis was he was already treated with metronidazole pura nahi pada isko theek hai here majority of the patients will remain asymptomatic they will have an incidental finding those patients who are symptomatic 
these are most of the patients will be asymptomatic those who are symptomatic <clears throat> those who are symptomatic they maximum presents to you with uh, enlarged liver they present you with enlarged liver span that is the first thing it can be associated with uh, dysphagia the liver will compress the gastrointestinal junction and might be associated with dyspepsia might be associated with dyspepsia so the first investigation for all of them is going to be ultrasound the investigation of choice is going to be cct to confirm bacteria you can culture parasites you cannot so hence it is elisa the management for pyogenic liver abscess it is going to be your usg guided aspiration it is going to be your usg guided aspiration with antibiotic if this fails then i will insert a pig tail catheter <clears throat> then i will insert a pig tail catheter whereas here for <clears throat> your amoebic liver abscess for amoebic liver abscess we'll try the patient on high dose metronidazole high dose metronidazole that is going to be around 700 to 1000 milligrams three times a day for 10 to 14 days this is the regime that you follow right on the other hand when you talk about the hydrated cyst for hydrated cyst we do something called as the pair therapy pair stands for percutaneous it is your percutaneous aspiration of hydrated fluid of hydrated fluid with installation with installation of scolicidal agent and re-aspiration and re-aspiration that is going to be your pair therapy that is going to be your pair therapy so this is in terms of your infective disorders in liver now then you have the benign tumors of liver these are your benign liver lesions now in the benign liver lesions we have the three varieties we have the hemangioma of the liver we have the focal nodular hyperplasia and the hepatic adenomas okay now let's try to understand each one of them hemangioma of the liver it is a misnomer as the oma means tumor hemangioma is vascular it looks like vascular tumor but it is not a tumor it is a vascular ectasia this is your vascular ectasia that is abnormally dilated blood vessel which looks like tumor focal nodular hyperplasia it is a hyperplasia this is your hyperplasia when i say hyperplasia increase in number of cells it is hyperplasia in response it is hyperplasia in response to vascular malformations for the vascular malformation Hepatic adenoma, it is because of HNF1 alpha gene mutation. It's the most common gene associated with mutation causing hepatic adenoma. For hemangioma of the liver, there is no specific risk factors, but OCP is considered to be as a risk factor for hepatic adenoma, right? These two are not considered to be pre-malignant. If the size of the hepatic adenoma is greater than 5 centimeters, it is considered to be pre-malignant. Now, all of them are going to be asymptomatic. All of them are asymptomatic. That means they will have an incidental finding. Complications hemangioma can be associated with rupture. The rupture can be associated with hemoperitoneum. It can be associated with hemoperitoneum as well as shock there are no complications in focal nodular hyperplasia hepatic adenoma also it is going to be extremely vascular 
सो दिस कैन ऑल्सो प्रेजेंट यू विथ हीमो पेरीटोनियम इट कैन ऑल्सो बी प्रेजेंटेड विथ हीमो पेरीटोनियम और प्रेजेंस टू यू ए शॉक वर्स्ट के सिनारियो इट कैन कम डाउन टू एज अ मालेग्नेंट लीजन सो देर इज अ मालेग्नेंट ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन देर इज अ मालेग्नेंट ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन दैट इज गोइंग टू हैपन हियर राइट अलोंग विथ ओ सी पी स्नो हेपैटिक एडनोमा इज ऑल्सो असोसिएटेड विद ग्लाइकोजन स्टोरेज डिजीज एंड नॉन एल्कोहलिक फैटी लिवर डिजीज so glycogen storage disease as well as non alcoholic fatty liver disease it is associated investigation of choice for all three of them it is going to be your triple phase ct it is going to be your triple phase ct is the investigation of choice hemangioma of the liver less than 5 cm you can leave it that is observation greater than 5 cm you have to remove it so here we do e nucleation we do e nucleation here it is only observation you don't need to do anything whereas hepatic adenoma less than 5 cm observe more than 5 cm because it has got malignant potential you have to go ahead with excision you have to go ahead with excision if it is more than 5 cm right so this is the component or the criteria that you should be aware of in terms of benign liver lesions now this is a variant of malignancy in the liver we have two variants the primary hcc and the fibrolamellar variant let's have a quick ratio here now in the hccs it is the male who are more commonly affected than female the ratio is 8 is to 1 fibro lamella variant of hcc you will see males and females are equally affected here the mean age of presentation is 55 years the fibro lamella variant will be seen at a mean age of 25 years the tumor here is going to be invasive in nature whereas here it is going to be a well circumscribed that's a well confined tumor resectability only 25% of hcc is resectable whereas fibro lamella variant 75% of these tumors are resectable it is associated cirrhosis it is not associated cirrhosis afp that is alpha fetoprotein is a tumor marker that is elevated here whereas fibro lamella variant afp remains normal another tumor marker that you will see elevated in your hcc is your protein induced vitamin k absence 2 that is pivaca 2 whereas in your fibrolamellar variant you will see the neurotensin you will see the neurotensin is elevated which is a tumor marker for your fibrolamellar variant of hcc association of hepatitis b is there for hcc there is no association or very minimal with fibrolamellar variant the prognosis for primary hcc is poor the prognosis for fibrolamellar variant is good it is considered to be a good prognosis right so these are the components uh, that you should be aware of in terms of your hepatocellular cancer and the fibrolamellar variant of hcc okay chalo moving down to the next component right now there are specific triads that you have to remember from the exam perspective they can ask you multiple times uh, so let's quickly look at those triads which are important right now The first one is a Carney's triad. Carney's triad is seen with multifocal gist, where you have multiple gist at the same time. So there are multifocal gist present with paraganglioma and pulmonary chondroma. Then you have the Macleod's triad. The Macleod's triad is Boerhaave syndrome, spontaneous esophageal perforation. As soon as how while you have perforate, the patient will have vomiting. That is vomiting or retching is there. then it will have sudden severe onset of retrosternal pain and surgical or i can say cervical subcutaneous emphysema that is a macleod triad then your bochart triad which is seen in gastric valvulus you know even the gastric valvulus in the stomach is going to twist obviously it will have pain retching without vomiting because stomach is compressed that the vomitus cannot come out and inability to pass nasogastric tube again a very important component murphy's triad it is seen in appendicitis pain vomiting and fever charcot triad is seen in cholangitis pain fever and jaundice quinky triad which is also called as the sanbulum triad it is in hemobilia
Spain, jaundice and Melina. Melina is the most common presentation. Then you have Tillox Trad seen in mesenteric cyst, which is you have a in a mesenteric cyst, you will see there's an abdominal mass which is present. That mass is mobile perpendicular to the line of mesentery, but fixed that the line of the mesentery, you will see a band of resonance around that cystic lesion. So you'll see abdominal cystic swelling, mobile perpendicular to the root of the mesentery, that is a telox sign, a band of bowel resonance in front of the cyst. As see, see, you'll have a cystic lesion around that you'll have resonance, above that you have resonance that indicates that is covered by bowel shadow on top of it. So these are the important triads to be remembered from the exam perspective in GIT. Now, quick feedback. Again, GI images. Bool bool ke thugge. Wapis push sharenge. What is the image number one? You will see multiple air fluid levels in a step ladder pattern. You see these hostrations, these, sorry, these structures. These are valvulae in conventi telling you that it is jejunum. So this is your small intestinal dynamic obstruction and the finding is your multiple air fluid levels. Now when we say multiple air fluid levels, 2 to 3 is normal. If more than 3, it is consistent with obstruction. Image number 2, you can see a nice component here. What is this? This is your bird beak sign. It is your bird beak appearance or also referred to as the pencil tip appearance. Also your pencil tip appearance. Needless to tell you, this is your Ecclesia Cardia. This is going to be your Ecclesia Cardia. Image number three, you see this is anterior, this is posterior, cervical region, there's a diverticulum that is present. So it is your Zenker's diverticulum. Here you see there's one bubble which is here, another one is gastric diordinal. This is your diordinal atresia and this is your double bubble sign this is your double bubble sign image number five you can see this is the right side this is the left side the diaphragm is elevated liver shadow free gas under right hemidiaphragm this is your hollow viscous perforation in a hollow viscous perforation you see free gas under right hemidiaphragm it is your free gas under right hemi diaphragm your free gas under right hemi diaphragm then you have image number six right this is in a neonate you can see this is an image for your chps which is called as your double track sign this is your double track sign or also called as the mushroom sign. You can see the double track which is here and you can see this is the mushroom sign, right? This is image number seven is also of CHPS ultrasound image. You can see this looks like a cervix, right? This is your antral nipple sign. This is your cervix sign that is present. You will measure this, right? So here we say the length should be more than 16 millimeters. The width should be more than 4 millimeters in order to call the patient is having CHPS, right? Here you can see a stacked mucosal rings which are present, right? This stacked mucosal rings that are present, as you can see, these are stacked mucosal rings and this is what we call it as the feline esophagus. Now this feline esophagus is seen in eosinophilic. It is seen in eosinophilic esophagitis. It is seen in your eosinophilic esophagitis, right? So these are the components that you have to remember with respect to your GI imaging. What are the other images which are important? Here you can see sawtooth appearance, right? So this is your sawtooth appearance. So where do you see sawtooth appearance? This is your diagnosis of diverticulosis, right? Then you see here. This is about a neonate. You see the air bubbles are present in the thoracic cavity. The heart is moved here. It is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. That is your Bosch Dalek hernia. Image number three. This is your technetium 99 scan. You see technetium 99 has got a very high affinity for your gastric type of mucosa as well as transitional type of mucosa. Ectopic foci, if it is present, this is your Meckel's diverticulum. Here you can see the classical bird of prey appearance. The bird of prey appearance is seen in volvulus. 
it is going to be a volvulus this is your again as x-ray for volvulus this is your coffee bean sign the coffee bean sign is also seen in volvulus this is also seen in volvulus this is the claw sign that you see the claw sign we have already described this is seen in intersusception this is seen on intersusception right so these are the gi images that are to be remembered now another image that you can see here you see a classical thumb print sign right now the thumb print sign the thumb print sign is seen in ischemic colitis it is seen in ischemic colitis usually spinet splenic flexure image number two you can see there is a massive distension and you see the bowel wall is also getting clearly visualized this is what we call it as the dome sign also called as the football sign or also called as this visualization of bowel this is what we call it as the regular's sign all these indicates towards hollow viscous perforation it is your hollow viscous perforation that is present right now uh, this is a repeat image so just leave it across here this is also a repeat image now this you can see there are findings a b and c now a it says there is some foci which looks like an ectopic stone so this is usually an ectopic gallstone this is usually an ectopic gallstone b is your bowel obstruction it is your bowel obstruction and C happens to be your nemobilia. So all these put together, no, one, two, three, obstruction of the bowel, gallstone, ectopic gallstone, nemobilia. This is what we call it as the Riggler's triad. This is what we call it as the Riggler's triad. The Riggler's triad is seen for gallstone ileus. It is seen in gallstone ileus the most common cause for the gallstone ileus the most common cause for the gallstone ileus is your bilioenteric fistula it is your bilioenteric fistula now what is the most common site for the bilioenteric fistula it is your cole cysto duodenal fistula it is your cole cysto duodenal fistula it's a fistula between the gallbladder and the duodenum. It's the fistula between the gallbladder and the duodenum. So all the possible images that can be asked in your exam is right in front of you. Right now, another GI image that you can see here. It is your retro cardiac shadow which is present. This is usually seen in your rolling heart hernia. Now this is your retro cardiac air shadow. It is your retrocardiac air fluid level or a air fluid shadow. Now, image number two is of foreign body. It is your foreign body. Now, how do you differentiate whether the baby has taken a coin or whether the baby has taken a button battery? So, I am saying this is coin and this happens to be your battery. How do you know? Now, coin will have a single rim, whereas the button battery will have a double rim sign, right? So, this is what we call it as the double rim sign and this is your single rim sign. This is your single rim sign. This, I hope everybody can follow it. This is this. What is this? On an esophagus, diffuse esophageal spasm this is what we call it as the cork screw appearance this is your cork screw appearance this is your apple core sign now this apple core sign as you can see hostration so it is colon so this is for your colon cancer this is for your colon cancer clear sure so that is all that in the context of gi component that you have to know Right. So far, any questions, guys? Quick feedback. So far, any questions? Quick feedback. Zada ho gaya? Zada fast ho gaya? Yeah, is it fine?
चलो लेट्स डू इट दिस वे वी गोट टेक अ ब्रेक फॉर फाइव मिनट्स और मैक्सिम टेन मिनट्स एंड देन विल टेक विद यूरोलॉजी एंड द जनरल सर्जरी पार्ट ठीक है टेक अ फाइव टेन मिनट्स ब्रेक विल रिज्यूम बैक
So, all right, guys, let's get started. Now, we we'll are talking about urology. I'll be talking about nephrolithiasis. As we all know, 90% of the renal stones are going to be radio opaque. Only 10 is going to be radio lucent. So, calcium oxalate stone happens to be the most common radio opaque stone. This is the most common. This is the most common radio opaque stone. This happens to be the most common radio opaque stone that is present. Phosphate stone happens to be the most radio opaque stone. It is the most radio opaque stone that you would see. Uric acid stone is the most common radio lucent stone. It is the most common radio lucent stone. Cysteine is considered to be as the hardest stone. This is the hardest stone. What is the cause for the calcium oxalate stone? It can be because of hypercalcemia. It can be because of hypercalciuria. It can be because of hypercalciuria. It can also be because of hyperoxaliuria. It can also be because of hyperoxaliuria. When we talk about the phosphate stones, the reason for phosphate stones, it is because of proteus infection. It is most commonly because of the proteus bacterial infection. Uric acid stone is because of excessive uric acid production. The example is gout. Cysteine stone is because of cystinuria. It is because of cystinuria, right? Now, when we talk about the characteristic feature, uh, the calcium oxalate stones, number one, they are round to oval in shape. They are round to oval in shape. They are dirty white in color. They are dirty white in color. They have sharp projections over the surface. They have sharp projections over their surface. And they are associated, because of sharp projections, they are associated with uh, hematuria. Now, phosphate, because they consist of three, three different, uh, I would say, crystals, that is ammonium crystal, the phosphate crystal, and the magnesium crystal. So, they are called as the triple stone. They are called as the triple stone. The other synonyms that you need to know, they are also called as the silent stone. They are also called as the stag horn calculi. They are also called as the struvite stone. Uric acid stones, on the other hand, they are formed in an acidic urine. They are formed in an acidic urine. The cysteine stones, they are going to be dirty black in color and they are hard in texture. Now, when you talk about the radio status, these are radio opaque. This is also radio opaque. This is radio lucent. Now, this contains sulfur. It is a sulfur containing stone. And we all know sulfur is radio opaque. On a urine microscopy, you see a classical presentation which is like this. This is what we call it as the envelope shaped crystals. This is what we call it as the coffin lid shaped crystals. This is you have multi-faced. You have multi-faced, which can be a rosette shaped crystals also. And this is your hexagon. This is your hexagonal crystal or also referred to as the benzene shaped crystal. This is your benzene shaped crystals, right? So the investigational choice is going to be CT urography. How do you manage? Size less than 5 millimeters in size, it is going to be your conservative management. Size between 6 to 15 millimeters, you do extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy, that is your ESW. Greater than 15 millimeters, you can go ahead with PCNL or else URSL, both of them are accepted. For stag horn calculi, I will do an ESWL with PCNL. If this fails to respond, then I will go ahead with open surgery. These are the basic concepts that you remember, right? Now, what are the contraindications for ESWL? The contraindication for ESWL, 
नंबर वन इफ द पेशेंट इज प्रेग्नेंट इन प्रेगनेंसी शॉक वेव्स आर कॉन्ट्रा इंडिकेटेड इन ओबेसिटी बिकॉज द शॉक वेव विल नॉट रीच टू द स्टोन टू ब्रेक इफ द पेशेंट इज हैविंग एनी ब्लीडिंग डिजॉर्डर अलॉन्ग विद ब्लीडिंग डिजॉर्डर इफ दे आर एनी डिस्टल यूरेट्रिक स्ट्रिक्चर्स इफ दे आर एनी डिस्टल यूरेट्रिक स्ट्रिक्चर्स दिस विल बिकम यूजलेस Along with that, if the multiple stones, which are called as steen straws, in German the steen straws basically means road of stones. It is the road of stones that you will see. These are the contraindications for ESWN, right? Chalo. Now, in a genital urinary tuberculosis, what are the cardinal features that you are going to see in the kidney? What will you see? in the kidney there will be presence of papillary ulcers there will be development of papillary ulcer it will develop into putti kidney it will develop into putti kidney it will associate with cement kidney there will be presence of cement kidney and eventually it will fibrose and that is what we call it as autonephrectomy it will be associated with auto nephrectomy when it comes down to bladder in the bladder what will you find in the bladder you will see there's presence of golf hole ureter there will be presence of golf hole ureter and it will also be associated with thimble bladder this will also be associated with thimble bladder in the prostate it will have hard indurated prostate it will have a hard indurated prostate that you will see because of tb bacteria in vas deferens you will see presence of beaded vas deferens you know beaded vas deferens scrotum it will have multiple discharging sinus it will have presence of multiple discharging it will have multiple discharging sinus uh, that you will see in your genito urinary tuberculosis these are the features uh, that you will see in genito urinary tuberculosis right now another comparative data that we should be knowing is between the undescendent testes and the ectopic testes right now what is the most common site for the undescendent testes uh, it is going to be present inside the inguinal canal it is going to be present inside the inguinal canal ectopic testes is seen in superficial inguinal pouch it is seen in superficial inguinal pouch status of the testes here they are going to be poorly developed they are going to be poorly developed in undescendent testes ectopic they remain normal secondary sexual character if it is a unilateral undescendent testes it is present if it is a bilateral undescendent testes secondary sexual characters are absent but here it is normal spermatogenesis is going to be decreased or lost it remains normal in ectopic scrotum will become planed out that means there is loss of rugosities there is loss of scrotal rugosities here it remains normal now the investigation for both of them actually the first is going to be clinical examination it is going to be clinical examination but if i say what is the investigation of choice to localize investigation of choice to localize the best answer would be your diagnostic laparoscopy is preferred over mri it is preferred over mri right so these are the component to be seen between the undescendent testes and the ectopic testes now as we did for gi we have for urology also what are the images that you have this is your you can see it is taking the image slightly hazy but this is the image for your stag horn calicula it is the image for your stag horn calicula you can see this stag horn calicula you can see it is your staghorn calculi that is present across here right so same image i've given this is also for your staghorn calculi this you can see both the ureters right okay the, i'll say image number 1 is here image number 2 this is your hydronephrosis now here you can see this is what we call it as the soap bubble sign this is what we call it as the soap bubble sign this is what we call it as the soap bubble sign you can see this is blocked 
it is what we call it as the urethroceal that is your adder head appearance the adder head appearance is what we call it as urethro seal it is your urethro seal variety right now here you can see it is your classical flower vase appearance where do you see your flower vase appearance the flower vase appearance will be seen in horseshoe kidney it will be seen in horseshoe kidney you can see this is your hooking of the ureter and this is what we call it as the fish hook ureter this is what we call it as the fish hook ureter now this fish hook ureter it is seen in retro cable it is seen in retro cable ureter where the ureter is encircling the ivc this is your spider leg appearance now the classical spider leg appearance is seen in polycystic kidney disease it is seen in polycystic kidney disease right so these are the important components but a hydronephrosis will have a nice bulge like this staghorn will have it is more radio opaque it will have more characteristic presentation like this right so this is your staghorn calliculi now these are your previous exam questions on a quick recap about drains this is what we call it as the silicon drain or silicon corrugated drain it's a silicon based corrugated drain that is present this is see silicon is going to be transparent when you see rubber that is orange color it is latex so this is your latex based corrugated drain it is your latex based corrugated drain here you can see it's a compressive negative suction drain this is what we call it as the romo vac drain this is what we call it as the romo vac drain this is what we call it as the pen rose drain this is what we call it as the pen rose drain then you have this is your foley's catheter that's a standard foley's catheter a variable of the standard foley's you have a three way this is what we call it as a three way foley's catheter the three ways foley's catheter is for bladder irrigation this is used for bladder irrigation this is used for bladder irrigation this is your pig tail catheter this happens to be your pig tail catheter this happens to be your t tube this is your t tube this is your naso gastric tube also called as the riles tube they have asked you how do you measure the adequate length in order to insert the riles tube let's say this is the nose of the patient and let's say this is the ear and this is the neck of the patient let's say this is the neck of the patient and this is the thorax this is the supra sternal notch that is there let's say this happens to be the sternum this is the fish sternum right so how do you measure the adequate length you measure from the tip of the nose to the ear lobe from the ear lobe to the zephy sternum and this is what we call it as the nex rule now in order to get the correct length we do nex rule whatever is the length that comes that much amount you are going to insert inside the body right now this is your jackson pratt drain now this jackson pratt drain is a negative suction drain this is your sbt tube that is your sangastkin blakemore tube it is your sangastkin blakemore tube it is used for bleeding esophageal viruses it is used for bleeding esophageal viruses this is used for bleeding esophageal viruses right latex is rubber latex is rubber silicon is going to be transparent silicon is biologically inert we prefer silicon everywhere latex is old where you have rubber based segment that you have right now the cannulas the color code the flow rate is important the first cannula that you can see here this is orange colored cannula 
this orange color cannula is going to be of 14 gauge with a flow rate of 240 ml per minute right so the next one that you have it is your gray colored cannula the gray is going to be 16 gauge with a flow rate of 180 ml per minute then you have the green colored cannula the green color cannula is 18 gauge with a flow rate of 90 ml per minute then you have the pink cannula right the pink cannula is going to be 20 gauge with a flow rate of 60 to 65 ml per minute it is your 60 to 65 ml per minute that you see then you have the blue colored cannula the blue cannula is going to be 22 gauge with a flow rate of 35 ml per minute then you have the yellow colored cannula which is going to be 24 gauge with a flow rate of 20 ml per minute then you have the violet colored cannula 26 gauge flow rate of 12 ml per minute with a flow rate of 12 ml per minute how do you remember it uh, we have our own ways now the core of the earth let's say the core of the earth is made up of lava let's say this is the core of the earth it is made up of lava and lava is going to be orange in color right so let's say this is the core of the earth the core of the earth is made up of lava above the lava what do you have you have the soil the soil is going to be gray in color above the soil what do you have you have the beautiful green trees that are present let's say this is the beautiful green tree above the green tree what do you have you have a beautiful pink flower that is present above the pink flower what do you have you have beautiful blue sky that is present so this is your beautiful blue sky that you have now in the blue sky what do we have we have our sun right so let's say this is the sun that is present in the beautiful skin now above the sky what do you have you have universe universe is going to be slightly darker that is going to be violet this is the universe that is present above this if you don't believe it this is universe just to get your perspective correct these are the stars which are present right orange is your 14 gauge this is your 16 gauge green 18 gauge pink 20 gauge blue 22 gauge sun is 24 7 24 gauge this is your 26 gauge right so this is how you're going to remember you're going to remember the entire components of the cannulas their flow rate and their color code okay shallow now energy devices this is your mono polar cautery this happens to be your bipolar cautery this happens to be your harmonic scalpel this happens to be your thunder beat is a thunder beat it has see when you talk about the thunder beat no you will have two buttons harmonic no button at all right that's how you remember now remember the energy source that you're going to use monopolar uses electrical energy it uses the electrical energy to work bipolar also uses electrical energy whereas here it is going to use the ultrasound energy that is going to be the sound waves that it generates so, so it is going to be the ultrasonic energy that is the ultrasonic energy it is going to be using it's a vibrating energy that it will use here it will use both electric as well as the ultrasonic energy that is a combined energy source that is a thunder beat right now remember this vibrates at a frequency of 20,000 to 50,000 hertz because it does not have any electrical energy it is safe in patients with pacemaker it is safe in patients with pacemaker now whenever we talk about the energy sources there are two currents that you need to know one is your cut current another one is your coagulation one is your 
cut current another one is your coagulation current right one is going to be cut another one is going to be coagulation now in the cut current or else we'll make it this way i'll take cut current first now in a cut current you say voltage on the y axis frequency on the x axis in the cut current it will have low voltage but high frequency and this is your cut current whereas when you talk about coagulation in the coagulation again voltage on y axis frequency on x axis you will see you will have high voltage but low frequency this will coagulate right so the cut current will have low voltage it will have low voltage but it will have high frequency coagulating current will have low frequency but it has got high voltage and that's your exam question right that is going to be your exam question right these are about your energy devices okay now not that's your last topic that you have to revise across here now in the knotting the first component that you see this is what we call it as the half hitch this is what we call it as the half hitch now this is what we call it as the granny's knot now the granny's knot is considered to be an unstable knot this is basically an unstable knot right now how do you see across here you see the red thread is going under the green loop here the red thread is going over the loop this is under this is above right here the green thread is going above here the green thread is going under the loop so one up one down it is granny's here you see the red thread is going under the loop here also it is going under the loop so this is your reef knot or also referred to as the square knot it is a reef or the square knot that is present and this is an example of a stable knot this is an example of a stable knot right both of them are under under here both of them are above above if both of them see both the threads on a single side are in the same direction it is going to be reef or square or a stable knot that is going to be present right on the other hand when you see this particular one you see you have two loops here and one loop on top and again there are both of them are above or both of them are under so this is above above this is under under that indicates this is your surgeon's knot and the surgeon's knot is the most stable knot it is the most stable knot this is the most stable knot clear right so this is all about the important topics of the general surgery that you are supposed to revise apart from that you have to look across in trauma there are again important topics in trauma as well and varicose veins okay so with the time that we had this is the maximum that i could cover for you and try to give you all the important aspects and in a comparative data so that you will be able to compare it well right but a most commonly used knot will be in terms of surgery it is going to be a surgeon's knot always we'll be using the surgeon's knot whenever you want to put it across we don't use grannies we don't use reef knot we'll be using surgeon's knot as overall most common clear guys right so any questions up until now any doubt any feedback anything that you want to give quick feedback quick feedback if there are no questions no queries let's roll it down here all the very best for the exam make sure you do two things correct one from this day till the exam don't give up right make sure that you have the focus right there revise 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 this is a time only to revise do not add anything new make sure that you are able to do your previous year questions previous year topics all the important topics that are predictable and do your notes this last stretch you have approximately 30 days one month it's a game changer right this is the month that you have to make sure you put your maximum efforts in and after that you all can relax chill right 
so all the very best guys thank you thank you we'll see you guys again have fun right signing off dr sandeep